All right, so that is the end of the description of how DNS works. Now, let's talk about how DNS can be attacked and the damage that that can cause. The main attack is called DNS poisoning. And the idea here is that bad information is put into a cache. If you get bad data into a recursive name service cache, that data gets given to unsuspecting clients. If my name server is requesting the IP address for google.com and it's lied to, and it caches it for a while, everyone who asks is going to be lied to as well, and not unintentionally. It's lied to because the DNS resolver simply doesn't know the correct answer. Or, if you on your own machine receive bad information because you're lied to, for instance, because the reply is, is manipulated, you would also just simply go to that other IP address. And crucially, this breaks the off-path assumptions that we have when it comes to routing traffic. Because if an attacker can position an arbitrary IP as being what gets rendered when you go to google.com, they've effectively put themselves on path. So if you can attack the DNS, you can put yourself on path and then make a lot of other attacks easier to do. Now, crucially, because if it weren't the case, this, uh, these attacks would be trivial, DNS does not accept unsolicited responses. It must be a response to a pending query. That is, I cannot simply send a packet to a computer saying, Google.com's IP address is my machine's IP address, coincidentally. Unless that machine is actually asking for that information at this moment in time, it has a pending DNS query, then this data will just be ignored. There's no, there's no, it doesn't get linked to any part of the operating system that would store that IP address. So what are actually, what's actually checked with a DNS query? Well, first, there's this UDP port. UDP ports, just like TCP ports, are these virtual ports that connect to endpoints on the internet. So if your packet is not delivered to the port that you're expecting to read it on, it will just simply be ignored. The operating system might receive a packet for a particular port, but if no one's prepared to read from that port, then no one will ever read this information. The operating system won't do anything with it, and no user space application will actually process it. Second, there's the question section. We repeat the question in the response. That has to match as well. So it can't just be an answer to a question that no one ever asked. It can't be the case that you asked for google.com and you're given bing.com's IP address as something. It's like, no, I've never asked for bing.com. Why would you tell me this? The query ID has to match as well. So now we have an actual number that has to be exactly the same number along with the port. So the port has to match, the query ID has to match, the answer has to be the same as the question being asked. And finally, there's something known as bailiwick checking, which is uh, an, a word referring to the zone of control of a bailiff. And that's a bailiwick. So the bailiwick checking is that the answers given, in particular the glue records, must represent information that this would be this DNS server would be asked about. In particular, if I were to ask Google.com zone master what is the IP address for www.google.com, and Google.com said Bing.com's IP address is this. Well, that's great that you want to share this information, but you have no... You would never be asked for this piece of information. 
So I have no reason to trust the information that you're giving me. This is the idea of bailiwick checking. It prevents you from just simply giving an answer and then stapling on 50 glue records that answer questions that you have no authority giving out answers to, that no one would ever defer to you. It's this idea that anyone can run a DNS server, but if you're not actually ever asked, then it doesn't matter what you say is true. So DNS poisoning attacks work if the attacker can send bad data that passes all these checks. Passes the UDP port check, passes the query ID check, passes that the question is being repeated correctly check, passes that the answer is to the question, and doesn't try to staple on information that shouldn't be there. And this is true for the recursive name server and all the clients of DNS. You can poison the name servers, the recursive resolvers. You can poison the clients. And typically, the poisoning attack works by changing this IP address. We saw as well with Let's Encrypt, text records were used to prove control over a domain. So you could imagine DNS poisoning for text records as well. If we're going to start adding security purposes to these text records, then it's of interest to an attacker to attack these text records as well. But traditionally, the idea of DNS poisoning is to poison this IP address because the user, when they look at their browser bar, will see google.com. But what gets rendered is whatever the IP address it actually went to told it to render, which if that IP address is not actually google.com, the user will not actually know unless there was some other way of telling. Because on the browser bar, it would just say google.com. The computer thinks google.com is this IP address. And this allows an off-path attacker to act as a man in the middle or an impersonator, basically position themselves onto path, even though otherwise they would not actually be off on path. And this is what makes this DNS poisoning attacks useful, because as we saw with TCP attacks, when you're on path, you have a lot more power than when you're off path. When you're off path, you don't know sequence numbers, and you'll end up triggering multiple responses that might lead to a reset eventually, where, for instance, the client is acknowledging data that the server never actually sent. And that would trigger a reset eventually. The key to a DNS poisoning is that the attacker doesn't need to be right every single time. Because if you send a DNS packet with a bad query ID, it's not that your computer just suddenly decides it's under attack and shuts down and turns off the internet. It just ignores it. It would be unusable. You could trigger a denial of service attack if everyone's computer just shut off the moment it got a bad DNS packet. So... Operating systems just ignore any DNS packet that doesn't match a pending query with the right port and the right query ID. But it doesn't consider it an active attack, even though it very well might be. And this makes it easier for the attacker because you can just send a flurry of possible query IDs and possible ports and hope to get lucky. And you don't have to get lucky every single time to eventually mount an attack. So, let's talk about how to actually do this. How do you guess the query ID? Well, first, it's not that big a number. I mean, it's big enough that you're not going to roll, you're not going to like get lucky and guess it on the first try. But it's not cryptographically strong. It's not that you could spend all of the possible time there is doing DNS queries for eternity until the heat death of the universe and still never get lucky once. It's only there are 16 bits because they were never meant to be cryptographically secure. Moreover, 
they used to just be incremented by one. It was a counter. It started at some number and then it added one every time I got a new one. So this is my 57th DNS query. This is my 58th DNS query. That's a great way to have different query IDs, which was the point. The design of DNS was not thinking about DNS poisoning attacks. The design of DNS was a happy internet where computers were trying to talk to each other and make that as easy as possible. The idea that query IDs had to represent an unguessable number was not part of the design, right? And this goes back to the security by design principle. We never meant to build these to stop DNS poisoning attacks. And so they, looking back, they seem really poor at stopping DNS poisoning attacks. At the very least, they should be much larger numbers, 128 bits. But that was not part of the design. But at the very least, they shouldn't at least be incremental. Now, nevertheless, how do you know what the original query is? You know that they increase by one every time, so you, you can predict them, but you still don't know where to start from. It's x, x plus 1, x plus 2, what's x? Here, you can ask a resolver for an IP in its own domain or rather in the attacker's domain. So you run a domain, attacker.com, and you go to your DNS resolver and say, can I have attack at attacker.com? And then you would receive the DNS resolve yourself. And that would have a query ID. And that query ID would reflect the query ID for the resolver. So in this sense, you're just tricking the resolver into revealing what its current query ID is. So query ID, it's learnable. It's, it's not that it has to be a sequentially increasing number, but a, for a large number of implementations, it happened to be. So it is learnable. And regardless, it's not cryptographically large. The UDP port is often not random, as we talked about. Frequently, it was also 53 or just some fixed port provided by the operating system. And the question matches query and bailiwick checking. This imposes some constraints on how powerful a DNS poisoning attack is. So you have to have someone actually making a query, and then you must have... And, and you can't throw in extra information. But still, it is possible to force a DNS server to do a query. For instance, you can have the DNS server answer it for you. So you could say to the DNS server, I would like to know the IP address of www.google.com. Now, let's assume the DNS server didn't have that in its cache. It would then go out and ask for it. And you know it's about to go out and ask for it. So at this moment in time, right after you ask it to ask for it, you start flooding it with answers. You give it as many answers as you possibly can, sending UDP packets to it, varying the ports, varying the query IDs based on the information that you have about what the query IDs might be, what the ports might be. You send it as many replies as quickly as you can and hope that yours gets in first because the simple rule of DNS in the operating system is the first good answer wins. There's no way the operating system can tell apart a good answer from a bad answer. It's just information. It has an IP address and it's this and the other one has the exact same packet structure except it has a different IP address. If the operating system knew which was right and which was wrong, it wouldn't need to go out and, and get this information in the first place. There's no authentication in DNS. There's no security in DNS. It's a UDP protocol without any encryption, and anyone is free to state whatever information they want on it. You can make it look as though it came from the DNS server, or the zone master server, the, the entity that would give this correct answer, because you can forge the IP addresses. 
And so your goal here in the attack is to give as many answers as quickly as possible so that one gets accepted because you're working under the constraint. You don't know exactly the query number and you don't know exactly the port. So you're just guessing them, knowing there is a pending DNS query. So as for a poisoning antidote, why don't we just ignore the bad IP? Well, we can simply just conclude there's no real way we can tell them apart, especially if we spoof the source IP address of the response. What about a poisoning antidote? We randomize the query ID. So instead of this idea where the attacker knows the current query ID is 9999, so we just flood it with 10,000 to 10,030 and hope that it's somewhere in that range. This makes it much easier to flood. But we could randomize the query ID. So the operating system, instead of having a, an incrementing one, just picks a random 16-bit value. Makes it much harder. Your probability of being able to flood a 16-bit a range of numbers is going to be less than a 10-bit range of numbers, or, and it's, or it's certainly less than a 5-bit range of numbers. Now, there are botnets, so you can leverage other machines to also do this flooding attack at the same time. So it's, it's still not a perfect defense. And again, security by design, query IDs are meant for organization and association of queries to responses, not for DNS poisoning defenses. If they were, they would be much larger than 16 bits. So we can randomize it. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't make it easier for the attacker when they're randomized, but it's a shaky ground to build the confidence of all of internet security upon. And this was the state of DNS for quite some time. We relied on on some amount of randomness and we decided that it would be good enough. That, yes, these attacks are possible, but it's not worth worrying too much about because, uh, you know, sometimes people's DNS gets poisoned and, you know, it's not such a big deal. Then came, in 2008, Dan Kaminsky's DNS attack which effectively was a simple DNS poisoning attack, exactly how we described. But he did something extremely clever, which made it so much more effective and so much more devastating that DNS servers actually patched. So servers running DNS software actually changed so that they would stop being so blatantly insecure to DNS poisoning attacks because of this attack. His approach was to hijack the authority records and not the DNS answer itself. Recall, when you do a DNS query, you are looking for the A record for some host name. But along the way, you get authority records like, oh, this server is in charge of .ca, and this server is in charge of .ucalgary.ca. His attack was to poison that, because if you could poison .ca or .com and have it point to an IP address of your own DNS server, you then control every single DNS query under that. Remember the tree structure. The roots are hard-coded, but everything else is looked up. If you can... The traditional DNS poisoning was poisoning the leaves. Kaminsky's was to poison the interior nodes of this tree so that you would actually poison the cache for someone responsible or for what is believed to be the person responsible for .com. And so all future .com lookups go to you. And you can say whatever answer you want. So let's get into this. <clears throat> 
Nothing stops anyone from just running a name server, right? The idea was no one would ever delegate to you if you just happen to run a name server. You can run a name server, you can listen on port 53, but you can't make people talk to you. So if you never get any questions, you'll never be able to poison any responses. Poisoning usually worked where you knew there was a query because you forced a DNS server to look up something. And then they get a bad answer. And that bad answer is given not only to you, but it also sits around in the cache and gets given to everyone else who asks for the same one afterwards. And the higher level servers are configured to delegate down to the lower ones. So the .ca name server knows who's responsible for .ucalgary.ca. This is this distributed database. It doesn't need to request the information. It just knows it. And that's why it's being asked for this piece of information. But the resolver... The thing that's going out and doing these requests, first to the top level, to the root servers, then to the global top level, and then to ucalgary.ca, they don't know who is responsible for .ucalgary.ca. They don't even know who's responsible for .ca, unless it's in their cache. That's why they're asking. They only know who's responsible at the root. So if we poison the resolver's understanding of who is responsible for .ca, who is the authority for .ca names, and have it point to us instead of the legitimate entity, then we can poison anything .ca, because we will then be asked. In a sense, we're putting ourselves on path. When Alice makes a DNS request to something .ca, if we've poisoned her resolver's idea of who to ask to get answers for .ca to be pointing to us, then Alice will ask us how to get to this website. And we can tell Alice whatever we want. And this also means we have very little additional effort afterwards. We only need to poison it once, and we'll just start getting queries all the time everyone will start delegating to us. Because everyone will think we are the authority for this information. So it's not that we have to poison every single time we want to do one of these attacks and really get lucky that it, there happened to be a, an actual request for www.google.com when we asked our DNS for it. It wasn't in its cache. It actually went out and did this, this search for who is responsible for this. All we have to do is poison at this higher part of the tree, effectively at one particular time, and now we'll just be asked for as long as this bad information stays in the cache. So, Kaminsky attack. Step one. The attacker requests a random name from the victim domain. So, if you ask for www.victim.bank.com, it's possible that the DNS resolver will give you an answer. So you ask for www.someRandomness.VictimBank.com, that one won't be in its cache. So this will trigger a DNS query. Then you send a flurry of forged packets. So this is very similar to the poisoning attack. Now the poisoning attack, this would only effectively poison whatever randomness you threw in there, .VictimBank.com. So it's not likely going to poison actual people. But by doing this and causing the DNS resolver to go out onto the internet and ask who's responsible for victimbank.com, you can then send a flurry of forged packets trying to specify who is the correct authority for all of victimbank.com, assuming that they go out and ask, what's the name server for victimbank.com? Then you ask the, the name server, what, how do I get to this random looking domain name? 
And the attacker can give honest names for a victim bank, such as dns.victimbank.com, things that might actually be the correct values, nothing that would raise alarm bells, but then you add the glue records. Here the glue records are pointing to the IP addresses. The attacker can put whatever IP addresses they want. So now it looks like the right information from the DNS resolver's point of view. There's no reason why it wouldn't have asked for this information. It's receiving an answer. The answer is what you expect. This is the name server. You're just being informed, oh, the IP address is now this, so you update your IP address. And you're updating your IP address so that now, anytime anyone requests victimbank.com, any IP address there, it just goes to the attacker. It's not that the, the attacker needs to poison when the actual www.victimbank.com is being resolved. The attacker gets asked, what is www.victimbank.com? The attacker just sits back and answers these questions afterwards once the authority records have been poisoned. That's the attack. Once the adversary controls the name servers, the authority records, the rest of the attack is then just DNS working as it's supposed to. That's the design, this distributed database. Classical DNS poisoning before the Kaminsky attack poisoned the leaves. This is poisoning the path above the leaves to point to somewhere else, to point to somewhere in the attacker's control. And then the attacker simply gets asked for answers to these leaf questions. Right. And the attacker controls or only needs to control one point in the chain to be able to take over everything below it. If you can compromise one node, then any normal DNS path that would go through that node would now go through you. And the higher up you get to control, the more devastating the attack. You can redirect web traffic, you can redirect mail traffic by altering the MX record, so now suddenly you're getting emails. Email is also not encrypted, so you're getting all of this emails for everyone from this domain now being sent to you. That's probably bad for whoever it should be sent to. You can give it a very high time to live. I'm assuming there's some maximum value, and I'm, I don't know what per se, but whatever it is, it's probably sufficiently large to make this very useful as an attack. It's probably not meant to thwart this kind of an attack. And so you specify the highest time to live as you can, or some value similar to that in case people are thinking, well, the maximum value, that's a bit suspicious, let's not trust that. And the longer you specify this time to live, the longer this bad data sits in the cache. Another thing is that you can keep looking for random host names if the first attack didn't work. So www.1.victimbank.com didn't work, try www.2.victimbank.com. Again, these are things that normal users will look up, so the poisoning if you were to just poison the IP address for that, it's useless, unless it happened to be something actually meaningful. But because it triggers a DNS request, it gives you the opportunity to actually do this attack. So you can, even if the attack is one in a million, you just do this a million times. And we know it's not one in two to the 128 because DNS was not designed to have this level of security. What's the fix? Well, it's the small space of these query IDs that makes the attack possible. That and, and the UDP port. Because if you knew the UDP port and the query ID, you can just do this attack. Even with randomization, having the ability to do this multiple times makes it still quite likely. So the solution to DNS, this is Kaminsky attack, 
is to randomize the UDP port as well. Remember we talked about the UDP port sometimes being 53 as well, sometimes being fixed and the same value for the operating system. It just, that's the port the OS uses for DNS. The solution to this attack, because it was so powerful and so devastating, was to randomize the UDP port and the query ID. Now we have 32 bits. It's hard enough, hopefully, that, you know, this, this it's not perfect, but I guess it'll have to do. We have, say, 2,000 random ports we can choose from. The entire space of UDP ports isn't available, but still, with 2,000, we have 16 bits of randomness there, or rather, 11 bits of randomness there, 16 bits with a query ID, 27 bits of randomness overall, 1 in 134 million is the chance of guessing it right. It's much better than, you know, 1 in in 65,000 or or something like that. So that'll have to do. And even private DNS recursive name servers are vulnerable to this attack. So this is an interesting thing to think about, which is you may not be eligible to send a query at all. So you can't trigger the DNS going out and looking up your your host name. So what can you do to help convince it to do that? Well, all you need to do is effectively run a web service that people want to go to. You run a web service. The web service has a bunch of links on it, image links, for instance. So people go to the website. They see the images or the images come to them as hyperlinks, so they then go out and get the images. Those images could come from www.victimbank.com, www.victimbank.com. So as long as you can get people to just visit your website from within a privately controlled DNS, and here privately controlled would be like customers of TELUS, for example, right? You may not need to be a customer of TELUS in order to trick the DNS resolver or an employee at a business. If some employee has their own private, or the company has a private DNS server, but the employee just goes to your website, their web browser will start doing DNS queries exactly as you wanted it to, and you know exactly when it's going to do it, as soon as it you give it the, the image tags to go and look at. Another thing is that even with all of the TLS and certificate infrastructure in place, this attack still works. Again, it's interesting to think about why. Because there's a certificate authority that says the public key of Google.com is this, signed VeriSign or what have you. And that means that if you were to trick google.com to go to your IP address, you don't have the corresponding private key to sign anything. So it doesn't seem like you could actually do anything. Well, not to speak ill of Let's Encrypt, but certificate authority is based on proof of control over domains, based on putting information up on a web service, putting text records in. Let's Encrypt democratized it so that everyone can now do this. But before, the basic validation that was occurring for TLS certificates was effectively the same thing. Can you receive email at this at this domain name? Can you post a text record? Can you put some web page up at this domain? If so, you get a certificate signed for you. So if you are able to hijack the DNS records and have google.com point to your IP address, you don't need to know google.com's private key in order to sign for things. You can just get a fresh new cert. You can go to a certificate authority, say, hi, I'm google.com. I mean, this particular example may not work because maybe there is some sort of list of 
uh, host names not to give out any any certs for. But the idea of it still stands. You don't need to know what their I, what their private key was. You simply just go out and get a new certificate signed on your behalf because you now control the IP from that certificate authority's perspective. And then the, when the user goes to your website, they see the lock icon and nothing is indicating anything wrong. And of course, you can even show the exact same website with a man in the middle attack. You don't need to have any visual clues that anything is wrong. The website can look identical with a nice lock icon to boot. So you might be thinking, surely there's a better way than just hoping that randomized UDP ports is sufficient to stop this attack. And there, it is true. We, we have a, a number of interesting types of cryptography, and we should be able to use some of it to have a more secure version of DNS. And this DNSSEC, which has been proposed long before the Kaminsky attack, and to my knowledge, still is not seeing any widespread use, but nevertheless is a simple and elegant solution to the lack of authenticity of these records. So how can we use cryptography to trust DNS more? First idea, we could do DNS over TLS. So you establish a HTTPS connection, there's certificates for your DNS resolver and, and for the root servers and the GTLDs, and we just take this whole certificate authority structure, which you know isn't perfect, but still, and then do all of our DNS over TLS. So immediate problem, DNS is UDP-based, so we, we couldn't strictly do DNS over TLS. But there's DTLS, so we could you do DNS over DTLS or use a TCP version of DDNS. The idea here being we just secure all connections from the computer to the local DNS server, the resolver, from the resolver to the root, from the resolver to the TLD, from the resolver to the authoritative DNS server. All of this separate, secure HTTPS connections or TLS connections. But problem with this is that DNS is meant to be fast. TLS is not. Not that TLS is unusably slow, it's just it's not part of the design. Only the most recent version of TLS has this zero round-trip time session resumption idea and one round-trip time for initial handshake. Until then, it was two round-trip times, which it wasn't necessary to do, but still, that's how it was done, just to establish the handshake. The idea of DNS is that you're doing all of this before you even talk to the IP you want to talk to, that this DNS is happening transparently to the user. You're not spending a huge amount of time doing DNS, it's just happening quickly. And the other problem is that you can't cache if you're having... TLS sessions. You're doing key negotiation, you're deriving a session key, and then you're communicating. We're, caching doesn't fit into this paradigm anymore. And caching is crucial for scalability. Caching is also the reason why these poisoning attacks can happen, but still, we cannot involve the root DNS servers on every single hostname resolution that occurs on the internet. It would break down. The idea is that for DNS, we actually need object security, not channel security. TLS gives us channel security, end-to-end. -end. Alice and Bob can talk, end-to-end, -end, encrypted. But actually, it's not that we need this. It's not that we care that Eve can't see what Alice is requesting over DNS. The only thing Alice needs to know is that what she gets is correct. That it is a correct IP address. We need it to be authentic, not to stop eavesdroppers. We want the DNS record to be 
think of it like an atomic piece of information. We're getting an object of data, and we want that object to have integrity. By way of comparison, think of GPS timestamps. If you're familiar with how GPS works, these satellites are just broadcasting the time. GPS spoofing is possible because you can also just broadcast the time. But if you could validate that this was actually the correct time, as claimed by the satellite, as opposed to just a random person, then you would have trust that this was, in fact, the time as reported by the satellite, and not just a random person. It's not that you need a TLS session individually, every single user of GPS with the GPS satellite, but rather the GPS broadcast needs to be able to attest to its own integrity. This is the idea with this object security. So, idea two, make DNS results more like certs, certificates. Right, certificates also embodies this idea of object security. We want a verifiable signature that guarantees who generated the data, and this can be done offline. There's a zone master, the zone master can say this IP at this time is, or this host name has this IP at this time, and it's good for this time to live. All of that can be signed, signed by the zone master. Now, you have to figure out that you trust the zone master, but it's a good start. We now have the leaf node secured. The leaf node being that actual host into IP linking get all of the information, have it signed by the zone master, now we have how do we trust the zone master. Well, we use the fact that we are building this tree all the way from the leaf to the root. The root servers, we already have a concept of trusting them because they're hard-coded in. This is the root server's name, this is its IP address. Why not just add their public key as well? Root server's name, root server's IP address, root server's public key. The root server can sign DNS records for the GTLDs. The GTLDs can sign DNS records for the zone masters. The zone masters can sign DNS records for the actual host names and the IP addresses and all that information. And all of this can be verified along the way. The Roots DNS server knows all the TLDs and it knows their signing keys. So the Root DNS can say, oh, you want .com? Well, this is .com and this is their public key. And then you go to the .com and the .com signs something and you can verify that that signature is valid. And part of what that it signs is this is the zone master for you, Calgary. I guess I said .com, so Google. This is the zone master for Google.com. And this is their public key. And now you can't poison it. Because if you poison it and point it to a different IP address, you're not going to have the private key to be able to have a signature along the way. And this is only order one more data to be stored. It's not, it's no, no entity in the system has to store an unreasonable amount of data now. They were already storing host names and IPs. That's constant amount of data per thing for per per uh, leaf or per child node in this tree, as as was described. Along with it, it starts a, a public key. That's not unreasonable. And same for the DNS clients. They just, in addition to storing the root servers and their IPs, they store their public keys, and we have DNSSEC. Well, it would be nice if we had it. As well, all of the keys and these signed results, these are cacheable because of this notion of object security. They're like tickets. And this achieves the scalability properties. If I go to my DNS resolver and I ask it for www.google.com, well, it doesn't need to go to the root and then to the .com and then to google.com if it already had the answer from google.com, it just gives the answer to Google for google.com and all of the chain of support. That is, 
the public key of Google.com, as reported by the the name server for .com, the authority for .com, and the public key for .com, as noted by the name the authority for .dot for root. All of these things that you would need to get in order to validate this chain of signatures from the root to the leaf and validate the hostname IP mapping, these can all be stored. So in addition to storing the result of the IP for www.google.com, you would then store this chain. Now here we have logarithmic, but in practice it's three, so arguably still a constant. And there's been a bunch of times where DNSSEC seemed like it was imminent, and it may very well at any moment spring into existence, and I'm sure that it's been successfully used and uh, within particular organizations might have been. But as far as I'm aware, it is still not the mainstream uh, deployment of DNSSEC, uh, the implementation of DNS that would vastly improve internet security, and that the solution to these DNS poisoning attacks, including the hijacking of the authority records, remains random UDP ports and random query IDs, because there at least you get 32 bits or however many bits more than 16 of randomness than just a random query ID.